please stand by. Good day and welcome to the NCD Alliance webinar. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Dr. Christina Parsons Perez, Capacity Development Director for the NCD Alliance. Please go ahead, ma'am. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this NCD Alliance webinar. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world. We have an action-packed 90-minute agenda for you today, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are going to be hearing today from Katie Dane, the NCD Alliance's Executive Director. We'll also be hearing from Elena Matska, Advocacy Manager for the NCD Alliance, based in Geneva, following very closely the different uh, WHO-related processes. We're also going to be hearing from Rosie Tasker from UICC, the Union for International Cancer Control, where she has advocacy and networks assistance. We'll be hearing from the NCD Alliance's Advocacy Officer, Priya Kanayasan, based in New York. We'll be hearing from NCD Alliance's Jessica Beagley, our Policy and Research Officer. We'll be hearing from Lucy Westerman, our Communications and Policy Officer, as well as Jimena Marquez Donahed, Communications Manager for the NCD Alliance. Next slide, please. Okay, we always have action-packed NCD Alliances, but this is a, a webinar that we know is particularly anticipated as it is the one preceding the WHA. So today we will first be hearing from Katie, um, who will be sharing some uh, important news regarding the, the NCD Alliance itself. We will then go on to delve into the 70th World Health Assembly. We will be sharing you the, all the different details regarding the different agenda items that are relevant to NCDs. We'll also be sharing the different advocacy priorities of the NCD Alliance for this specific World Health Assembly. We will be sharing with you the different side events that will be happening on the margins of the WHA. And we will also be sharing with you um, an update on uh, the, the communications efforts targeting the World Health Assembly and also what the key messages of the NCD Alliance are. Welcome to everyone that's on this call that is a communications lead. Um, we will also go on to talk about the WHO Global Conference on NCDs that is scheduled to take place later this year in Uruguay in October. And finally, we will close out the webinar by updating you on uh, the NCD Alliance Accountability Toolkit that we are expecting to launch um, in the near future. Um, so without further ado, next slide please. Over to Katie Dane, Executive Director of the NCD Alliance. Thanks, Christina, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so before going into the, the World Health Assembly and all the policy details that many of you are on the line for, no doubt, um, we wanted to start off by highlighting an important organizational milestone for the NCD Alliance that will be taking place at this um, World Health Assembly. As many of you know, we were set up as an alliance eight years ago in 2009, um, originally by four international federations bringing on three more federations um, a few years ago um, to create an informal alliance um, of federations and a network of 2,000 organizations. What's happening at this World Health Assembly that's very important from an organizational development perspective for us is that after an extensive review process, which many of you um, were involved in, we will be evolving from an informal alliance um, to a standalone NGO that will be registered in Switzerland um, with a newly appointed president, um, a board, and a consolidated membership base. Um, while this transition won't change the operating model and the strategic priorities of, of NCDA that many of you will be familiar with, um, it does signal a new um, era for us as an organization, and it also has important implications for our network and from a governance perspective. So just to highlight a few of these changes, and I should say right now that obviously during the World Health Assembly, for many of you that will be there, um, we would obviously um, relish the opportunity to talk to you more about these changes and what it, what it means um, for our organizations and members in our network. So, so why are we changing to become a, an NGO? Um, firstly, uh, for us, it's really about inclusiveness and establishing a platform for growth. 
when we were set up in 2009, I think it's fair to say that the NCD community wasn't as diverse and as um, dynamic and lively as it is um, today. And so we're moving to become an NGO um, in order to become much more inclusive and to have more formal ways of, of engaging by our network and our members. So we're doing this in two ways. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have a, a board um, of 13 um, people. Four of them will be from the founding federations, and the others will be um, elected individuals. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we've got a fantastic first board, um, which really is representative across all geographies, all constituencies of the NCD community, um, and really balanced in terms of gender as well. Um, and so we'll be announcing later this week, um, via a network release, our, our first board for the term 2017 to 2019. And most of our board will actually be at the World Health Assembly, so I hope you'll have a chance to, to meet um, them during your time in Geneva. Uh, the second way that we're doing this in terms of inclusiveness is to, to shift to a membership um, model. Um, obviously, many of you will be familiar with our common interest group that we set up back in 2009, which has those 2,000 organizations in 170 countries. We're very much planning to keep that intact as our information exchange platform, where obviously all organizations receive webinar invitations and newsletters, etc. But what we're also doing is establishing a new membership structure, which will provide organizations from across the NCD community opportunities to become much more formally and actively engaged in the NCD Alliance as both members um, and also as being able to put themselves forward as board members. So we're really excited about those two um, important changes. Finally, the reason why we're, we're doing this is also um, in, a, in an ambition to ensure that NCD Alliance is fully sustainable um, for, the, for the coming years. Um, as we all know, alliances are you know, notoriously hard to maintain and sustain, uh, particularly when we're all operating in very complex and, and competitive landscapes. So this is a real attempt to unlock, for us, opportunities for strategic partnerships, as well as to really strengthen the NCD Alliance's legal foundations, because obviously we see ourselves in this for a long period of time whilst the challenge of NCDs is, is still there. So as I said at the beginning, um, more than happy to, to talk to many of you during the World Health Assembly about these changes. Please look out for um, information about how to become a member, which will be forthcoming um, around June time um, with our different membership um, structures. Um, as well as, as I say, the first board and our first president will that be, be at the World Health Assembly, and this will be announced um, later this week. So it's a very exciting moment for the NCD Alliance, and I hope you too see this as an important um, step forward for us as an organization. So thank you. Back to you, Christina. Thanks. Thank you, Katie, for sharing that a hugely exciting organizational milestone. Um, as you heard from Katie, uh, please... Uh, please get involved uh, in the different ways that, uh, that she has just outlined and expect to hear more from us with the different uh, expected announcements. Um, right, I think we shall uh, embark um, into the, the, the bulk of this uh, webinar, which is focusing on the 70th World Health, World, World Health Assembly. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Elena Matska, NCD Alliance's Advocacy Manager. Over to you, Elena. Thank you very much, Christina, and a warm welcome to everybody around the world that has joined this webinar. It's a great pleasure for me to be sharing um, my insights and our advocacy priorities uh, for this World Health Assembly. Feel free to note down your questions in the chat um, feature here on your screen. Um, Christina will collect them, and then we'll have a chance after my presentation to, to take questions. Can I go to my first slide, please? All right, so I will be covering the World Health Assembly, which, as most of you will know, will take place from the 22nd to approximately the 31st of May. Um, it will take place in the UN Palais des Nations in Geneva, in Switzerland. And I have included here on the first um, slide a few page web pages that you can um, note down as your resources. So one, the first one is the NC Alliance World Health Assembly page, which includes a variety of, of information from um, 
general information to our site events, and we'll also be uploading our uh, statements there and, and any live updates um, during the week. All of the official WHA documentation can be found at the link provided here too, which will be live once we share these slides following the webinar. So these slides, all of the, the presentation will be shared with you after the webinar, and all of the links included on our slides will then be active. The preliminary WHA journal, which includes um, a detailed daily timetable and more information on technical briefings, side events, the official side events during the week, etc., can be found here as well. And while I'll be, fo I'll be focusing on the World Health Assembly, I've also included a link here to the documentation for WHO's Program Budget Ad and Administration Committee, which is meeting from the 18th to the 19th of May, so ahead of the World Health Assembly and a link for the documentation for the WHO Executive Board, which will take place right after the WHA on the 1st and the 2nd of June. Next slide, please. A brief overview of, and a very simplified overview of the schedule for the World Health Assembly. On Monday, the 22nd, the assembly opens. We'll also have the traditional and this time last addressed by the Director General, Dr. Margaret Chen. And then on Tuesday, the new Director General will be voted in. The, the actual sessions, the actual election will be closed to the public, and then once the Director General has been appointed by the majority of the World Health Assembly delegates, um, this, there will be a public announcement and probably um, some celebratory um, events as well. Similar to the January Executive Board Award, NCDs will most likely only be taken up on the Saturday of the week and con then continue on to the Monday with the, the 29th. Next slide, please. So, NCs um, as well as the agenda item on promoting health throughout the life course will be um, rather late um, at the towards the back end of the week. And then, as I said before, um, we will also be, be following the WHO Executive Board, the 141st session, which will take place on Thursday and Friday, the 1st and 2nd of, of, um, of, uh, of June. And um, amongst other agenda items will be specifically following the agenda item on rheumatic heart disease, which our colleagues at the World Heart Federation are, are leading on um, and which is a, a real win to, to see on the agenda of the WHO Executive Board. And again, I've included here a link to the daily timetable of the WHA so that you can study the timetable in greater detail. Next slide, please. With regards to the WHA agenda, here a very um, short overview from an NCD's perspective. Obviously, we'll be following the elections of the Director General. We'll be certainly following agenda item 15 on non-communicable diseases, which includes eight sub-items, including the main um, report on NCDs, which is 15.1, the preparations for the 2018 UN high-level meeting on NCDs. We'll also be following the agenda items on the Global Action Plan on Dementia. Um, we'll be following the Implementation Plan Ending Childhood Obesity, the Cancer Resolution, um, and pretty much all of the agenda items to um, lesser or more details that are listed on the slide. Next slide, please. We'll also be following the agenda items on health systems, promoting health throughout the life course, um, as well as the agenda items related to WHO's program budget and um, the proposed scale of assessments and um, engagement with non-state actors. As you know, we um, always have a specific focus um, on the 2030 agenda and highlighting NCDs in the context of sustainable development, um, uh, an increasing priority for us are also 
um, agenda items related to environment, to the environment, um, as well as uh, women's, children's, and adolescents health. Next slide, please. Great. So here are just a very few overview with probably um, most of you, um, for most of you, this is not new. I just wanted to um, provide a, a very short overview of the final candidates to um, become the next WHO Director General. The first candidate is Tedros Adhanom, um, who is Ethiopia's um, uh, previous Foreign Affairs Minister and former Health Minister. Um, and for all of these candidates, as you can see, I've included um, a link to their um, website so that you can inform yourself on, on the details of the candidates. Um, Dr. David Navarro, um, who is um, probably um, not a new face to, to many of you. Um, he's currently the Special Advisor for Secretary um, General Ban Ki-moon on Sustainable Development, and Dr. Sanya Nishtar from, from Pakistan, who's Pakistan's former health minister as well as um, the founder of the NGO Heart File in, in Pakistan. Next slide, please. So the elections will take place on Tuesday, the 23rd of May. As I said previously, the elections will be closed to the public. Each country will have one vote, so it doesn't matter how big or how small the countries are. Interesting exception here is obviously that, as you may know, there's always a couple of member states that are suspended temporarily from membership to the WHO, um, mainly for not having paid their membership fees, and they're actually excluded from the election. So not all WHO member states will be voting, only those um, that have paid their fees. Um, the Director General is appointed on the basis of a clear ma majority. Um, and this means that there may be one or several rounds of um, voting. So depending on how um, clear the majority is, the elections may take longer or shorter. And there is a WHO um, FAQ on the DG election, which I've hyperlinked here with um, possibly all questions, all and any questions that you could have on the deal, on the election. So, if you have any questions on the, the the actual process of the election, I recommend that you you check this this website out. And then the the next DG will take office on the first of July. So there is a a, a, a transition period of about six weeks um, in between the um, the transition between. Uh, the current Director General and the new Director General. Next slide, please. All right, so the, once the, the next WHO Director General is elected, the Alliance will, um, as many organizations, I assume, respond to the election results by welcoming the new Director General and really emphasize the need for, and in fact, the expectation from the NCD community for visionary leadership from the next Director General to strengthen, to, to strengthen WHO's role as the leading UN agency on NCDs. We hope that the next Director General will capitalize on the potential for co-benefit solutions for our NCDs and other sustainable development parties. Um, and we will also call on him or her to prioritize the mobilization of financial resources for WHO's work on NCDs, which, as you may know, is chronically underfunded. Next slide, please. Actually, move on to the next slide. So I'll be um, now focusing on agenda item 15.1, report on the preparations for the 2018 UN high-level meeting on NCDs. This report actually isn't published yet, so it's not available on the WHA documentation website, but the report will be very close in content to the report that went to the executive board in January. It will provide an update on progress against the four time-bound national commitments that member states made in 2014 at the high-level 
review. Um, the, the update on progress is a little depressing, as in 2015, 138 member states had shown very poor or no progress, and this trend hasn't changed fundamentally. It lists the main obstacles to implementing national NCD responses. It touches briefly on the progress report that the WHO Director General will submit for consideration to the UN General Assembly. This will now take place in November, previously envisioned for August. And it will speak to the 2018 UN high-level preparatory process, including global and regional multi-sectoral member state consultations that should take place ahead of May 2018 to provide inputs to the 2018 high-level meeting. And it's foreseen that the results of all of these consultations that will take place between now and May 2018 will be reported to the 71st World Health Assembly in May 2018. Next slide, please. The report will also touch or, or mention um, in detail the proposed work plan for the global coordination mechanism on NCDs. It will probably include some more detail on the Montevideo Conference on Policy Coherence for NCDs, which is scheduled to take place from the 18th to the 20th of October this year is hosted by the president of Uruguay, Tabare Vasquez, and my colleague Priya will tell you a bit more about this conference later on in on, on this webinar. It also reports on the evaluations of the um, on progress on implementation of the global NCD action plan and um, the preliminary evaluation of the global coordination mechanism, and it will speak to the approach to register contributions from non-state actors, mainly from the private sector. Um, and unless member states request otherwise, this, the work to further develop the register will begin after the World Health Assembly. There were no major comments on this item at the executive board, apart from um, the fact that several member states highlighted the need for, to prioritize quality over rushing this piece of work, and I understand that um, this is one of the items that will land on the desk of the, the new Director General to decide how the, the agency will take this, this work forward. Next slide, please. So I want to focus a little bit more on one of the um, pieces of work that are included in the report on NCDs um, that will go to the World Health Assembly, and that is Appendix 3 of the Global NCD Action Plan. The Appendix 3 is what was previously called WHO's best buys for, for NCDs, a um, set of um, cost-effective interventions for NCDs that are recommended by WHO, and I've spoken to, to this on previous um, webinars, but I want to spend a bit more time on this webinar to provide you with an update on where this work is. So in terms of what has changed compared to the original Appendix 3, which was adopted with the Global NCD Action Plan, there's um, no substantial changes in the process-related objectives 1, 2, 5, and 6. Um, and the bulk of the changes have taken place across objectives 3, which is on prevention, and 4, on health system. There's now a total of 89 interventions, which is an increase from the 62 that were included in the original appendix and this increase is mainly due to the um, availability of scientific evidence, um, as well as the need to disaggregate some previous interventions into more defined and implementable options. The sections on unhealthy diets and physical activity um, were disaggregated, which um, these two were, they were lumped into together in the previous appendix. Um, and now we have, in the current version, we have 16 interventions that are identified as most cost-effective and feasible for 
implementation. And it's these most cost effective and feasible for implementation, these 16 interventions that um, are um, highlighted in, in bold in, in the appendix. There are 20 cost effective interventions and there's also 36 other interventions that have been included, um, however, without cost effectiveness um, analysis. And these 36 where no cost effectiveness analysis has been undertaken are, are interventions that, that come from WHO guidance documents on, um, on prevention related issues and, and health systems. So as an example, for example, um, as an example, you have um, under the most cost effective interventions, the increase of excise taxes and prices on tobacco products, whereas provide population-wide support for smoking cessation is classified as cost-effective, so not most cost-effective, but cost-effective nonetheless. And then amongst the, the um, interventions that are included without cost-effectiveness analysis, we have implement measures to minimize illicit trade of tobacco products. The current appendix also, very importantly so, um, acknowledges the limitations of cost-effectiveness analysis, and it very much highlights population-based interventions, including fiscal policies and environmental changes as effective strategies to reduce inequalities in the prevention and control of NCDs. Next slide, please. A couple of examples for the types of changes that we see in compared to the original Appendix 3. So for example, in tobacco and tobacco control, um, there is a, an intervention added um, on, to implement plain and standardized packaging and or large graphic health warnings in all tobacco packages. And this is the most cost effective um, highlighted among the 16 most cost effective interventions, for example. So this is a new intervention um, under alcohol control. There's also um, several new, more specific interventions that have been added. However, nothing has changed on the level of those that are most cost effective. As I said previously, unhealthy diets and physical activity now have their separate sections, um, and both of them have an expanded set of interventions on unhealthy diets. For example, um, it's also notable that WHO has dropped the reference to voluntary reformulation. It's now um, no longer talking about voluntary. Um, and um, really, um, we're very pleased to see taxation of sugary, uh, sugar sweetened beverages included in the current appendix. On physical activity, I think the changes, changes have been significant. It was previously very, very broad in terms of the interventions that were included, and now we have a much more specific set of interventions, including physical activity counseling as part of primary care, public awareness campaigns for physical activity, and um, physical activity as part of whole-of-school programs. With regards to Objective 4 on health systems, the new interventions added across Objective 4 include multidisciplinary treatment of early cancers, primary prevention for rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, the addition of a basic palliative care package for cancer, and treatment of acute um, stroke with intravenous um, thrombolytic therapy. Next slide, please. All right, so you may remember that at the executive board in January, member states requested a technical briefing um, from the WHO secretariat, which would walk them through the scientific analysis underlying the update of Appendix 3, and um, which be an opportunity for them to pose questions to the secretariat. Um, as well as review additional changes that were foreseen between the Executive Board and the World Health Assembly due to some of the analysis still um, ongoing at the time of the Executive Board. And this technical briefing took place on the 24th of April, and WHO has made available a very comprehensive document listing all of the questions from member states and the responses provided from the WHO Secretariat on the website, which I have included here on this slide. And if you 
wish to um, understand the, the questions that member states may have had for this process and the responses from the WHO Secretariat detailing the analysis that went into the Appendix 3 update, I recommend that you visit the web page included on this slide. Um, some of the changes to the appendix that um, were made between or actually all of the changes that were made between the executive board and now, it's not many, but um, the, the most notable are on unhealthy diets and physical activity simply because some of the analysis on, on these um, sections of the appendix were still ongoing. So that was the analysis on cost effectiveness of taxation of sugar sweetened beverages. Um, is now completed, is included as a cost-effective intervention, of, um, but not as a most cost-effective intervention. And um, um, in the implementation of public awareness and motivational communications campaigns for physical activity um, to affect physical activity behavior change has been classified as most cost-effective. Um, so next slide, please. Great, so there will be a resolution on NCDs. Um, it's the same resolution that went to the executive board. This resolution notes the work plan of the global coordination mechanism. It urges member states to implement their international commitments and support the 2018 high-level meeting preparations at national, regional, and global level. It requests the Director General to submit a report on the preparation for the 2018 high-level meeting um, for consideration next year at the World Health Assembly. And the original resolution calls for an endorsement of Appendix 3. However, at the Executive Board, this endorsement was put into brackets, into square brackets in the resolution text which means that at the World Health Assembly, a member state has to suggest to remove these brackets um, so that the World Health Assembly endorses Appendix 3. And unless a member state has any objections to Appendix 3, the World Health Assembly should then endorse um, this, this piece of work. And we also understand that the, that there may be an additional reference or an additional sentence, an additional action added to the resolution that will go to the WHA, and that is to welcome the WHO Global Conference on NCDs in Uruguay in October. But this is um, still um, not entirely confirmed, but we understand that likely that this point will be added. Next slide, please. So I just want to pause here to recap some of the advocacy priorities that are specific to the report on NCDs. First of all, we strongly support the endorsement of the updated Appendix 3 without any additional changes, and also call on member states to then implement these recommended cost-effective interventions. And it's important to understand that Appendix 3 um, is quite a sensitive document mainly because of the references to regulatory and fiscal policy recommendations. And so it's very important that no member state ask to reopen the document at the World Health Assembly, because if anybody, for whatever reason, decides to open this um, document, it's basically an excuse for other member states to request the removal of, of certain interventions and turn this scientific piece of work um, that the WHO has prepared and was mandated to prepare into a political document, make it a political discussion. And for us, it's very important um, that we don't see member states reopening this, this document at the World Health Assembly um, and, and potentially remove our, or, or ask to remove um, certain interventions because it doesn't fit with the politics of a certain um, member state. Then um, the second of our advocacy priorities is really around the 2018 high-level meeting preparatory process. We call on member states to really begin to prioritize this preparatory process to ensure that in 2018 we will have heads of state and government participate in the high-level meeting, that there is broad political mobilization across not only the health and NCD 
sector, but relevant non-health sectors, that people living with NCDs in civil society is meaningfully engaged in the lead up and during the high level meeting, and that we'll see an action-oriented outcome document with bold commitments for all relevant sectors as um, the outcome of the meeting. Next slide, please. We'll also be calling for the mobilization of adequate and sustained financial resources for NCDs to close the resource gap for NCDs at the global and national level. And while this is um, a, a broader call, um, we also have um, we also specifically support the proposed increase of assessed contributions. These are the the member states fees, so to say, that member states pay to the WHO to fund the work of the agency. Um, the Director General is currently proposing a 3% increase in assessed contributions for the proposed program budget 2018-2019. This amounts to 28 million US dollars. And this is considerably less than the increase of 10% that was originally proposed by the Director General um, and presented to the Executive Board. However, a lot of member states felt that this was too much. And although a 3% increase is relatively small in relation to the overall program budget of the WHO, its adoption would still be an acknowledgement of the need for an increase of assessed contributions, um, which is in fact the first increase since the program budget of 26. Um, 27. And from our perspective, we very strongly support this proposed increase in assessed contributions to help fund, um, amongst others, the, the, the work of the, the organization on NCDs. Next slide, please. We've covered the, um, our, our priorities for the preparatory process for the 2018 high-level meeting on um, previous webinars. I want to very, very briefly run through these again um, and, and then also share with you um, a link to our overview document of these process parties and very, we very much encourage you to champion these process parties with member states. The first one is um, to hold regional preparatory meetings in all WHO regions to prepare governments early to, to define regional priorities. Um, as input into the process and into the outcome negotiations. We um, call on member states and the, the UN General Assembly to convene a UN Civil Society Task Force as the official mechanism through which civil society can provide input into the preparations for the high-level meeting. We call, we call for, the, for an interactive civil society hearing to take place no later than two months prior to the high-level meeting to provide an opportunity for member states to listen to the parties of civil society. Next slide, please. Um, and as I said before, we think it's essential that participation of member states must be at the heads of state and government level. 2018 really marks this important midway point to achieving the 25 by 25 targets and the engagement at the highest political level is, is a critical success factor for meetings um, um, such as this high-level meeting. We um, hope to see the high-level meeting take place in September 2018, just prior to the General Assembly for a, the length of, for a length of two days. It may be that the high-level meeting be held um, consecutively with the high-level meetings on antimicrobial resistance and tuberculosis, um, but it's important for us that it happens um, during the high-level segment or close to the high-level segment of the UN General Assembly. And then um, important, again, that the high-level meeting conclude with an action-oriented outcome document, which is the strongest um, agreement um, within the UN for international cooperation. Next slide, please. All right, I'm now going to move um, on to other NCD-related agenda items, such as the Global Action Plan on, on Dementia, which should be endorsed at the World Health Assembly this year. It, um, there's a, a decision that was 
um, adopted at the Executive Board, which recommends to the World Health Assembly to endorse the action plan. It urges member states to develop ambitious nat national implementation strategies, and it also requests progress reports in 2020, 2023, and 2026 on the plan's implementation. So our messaging around here is very much supportive of the, um, the endorsement of the action plan and really focusing on the development and implementation of national plans with targets and monitoring frameworks at the national level that are costed and accompanied with a, a clear budget for implementation. Next slide, please. 15.3, um, the report on the public health dimension of the world drug pl problem notes the interlinkages between SDG targets 3.5 and um, 3.4 and 3.8. It reports that WHO is intensifying its efforts to ensure coherence of public health-oriented drug-related policies in areas such as NCDs and mental health, access and, and, and use of essential medicines and alcohol and tobacco control. Um, WHO is to intensify and expand its activities um, regarding normative guidance and ensuring access to control sub controlled substances for medical and scientific purposes, for example, um, in the um, area of effective cancer control and, and palliative care, and um, it notes that WHO is continuing to review, review, uh, re review medicines for pain and mental and behavioral disorders for the addition to, to the model list. Um, the action here for the WJ is to invite uh, to, to note the report and to provide further guidance on the implementation of the operational recommendations that um, were made um, at, related to health at this special session of, uh, on the world drug problem, the UNGAS, that took place in April 2016. Next slide, please. Another of our advocacy priorities is around ending childhood obesity. The WJ will consider the implementation plan on ending childhood obesity, which is basically the operationalization of the recommendations of the WHO Commission on Ending Childhood Obesity. We are very pleased that the integrity of the initial package of recommendations has been maintained. We are pleased with the strong emphasis on population-based regulatory, legislative, and fiscal measures, including the taxation of sugary drinks and marketing restrictions. We are very happy with the strong recognition of the role of civil society in tackling childhood obesity. And also um, note the, the much more nuanced approach to conflict of interest compared to previous versions of the plan. For example, the plan recognizes that industry self-regulation is often used as a strategy to defer effective regulation and um, largely ineffective. We have slight concerns around the recommended action for the private sector. There's two recommended actions for the private sector, um, one of which is to facilitate access to and participation in physical activity, which we believe is not an appropriate action for the food and beverage industry, which is known to use um, a focus on physical activity to, 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 to distract from the um, focus of their core business, which is um, the production of, of food and beverage is largely um, responsible for, for contributing to the epidemic of childhood obesity. Um, and we also um, note the lack of monitoring the accountability mechanism to track progress against the plan. Next slide, please. Our next slide. So our advocacy um, messages thus are we generally support endorsement and, and really call member states to endorse the implementation plan. Um, we highlight that it's um, incredibly important to address the commercial drivers of the obesity epidemic and believe that interactions between governments and industry should be government-led, health goal-oriented, transparent and accountable with industry making smart commitments focused on their core business. So here, again, food and beverage um, industry needs to focus on their core business and not distract um, by focusing on um, physical activity, for example. We call on um, member states to develop and implement national childhood obesity strategies based on the 
global implementation plan, and then um, very much call um, on member states to mandate the secretary to develop a monitoring evaluation framework for the plan with clear targets and indicators. Um, such a framework can be based on a review of existing indicators and reporting mechanisms and um, baselines. Um, but we're concerned that in the absence of a strong monitoring and evaluation framework, the plan would not deliver on its objectives effectively. Um, and we um, note here, for example, the PAHO Plan of Action for the Prevention of Obesity in Children and Adolescents, which is a great example of a plan that includes time-bound objectives and indicators with associated baselines and targets for the implementation of effective policies, laws, regulations, and interventions. So strong call to member states here to mandate this development of a monitoring and evaluation framework. And we've been doing some targeted um, advocacy with member states on this issue. If you're working on this and you would like to know more, please feel free to contact me and I'll um, be happy to discuss this in more detail. Next slide, please. So at this point, I will briefly pass over to my colleague Rosie Tasker at the Union for International Cancer Control to provide us with an update on the 2017 cancer resolution. Thank you very much, Elena, and thank you to everyone who's taking part in the webinar today. Um, we'll try and keep this relatively brief, um, but as many of you may be aware, we're due to um, discuss the cancer resolution at the WHA this year. Um, entitled Cancer Prevention and Control in the Context of an Integrated Approach. Um, you can access the report at the link on the slide, um, and it's currently scheduled for discussion around Monday, the 29th of May. Um, in terms of where we are at the moment, um, the majority of the text is green, which means that member states are in consensus. Um, I apologize for the type on the slide. Um, the version, the latest version that we have dates the 13th of March, and that's certainly the case that it's predominantly settled, which is great. Um, in terms of the, the text as an NCD tool, um, it's pretty comprehensive at the moment. We're really wel we really welcome it. Um, we really appreciate the emphasis it has on the need for an integrated approach to cancer. And it actually goes through and identifies kind of poor disciplines, surgery, essential med, essential technologies. Um, Another key part of it from an advocacy point of view is that it identifies and um, mandates the WHO Secretariat to produce a World Cancer Report in 2019. So that's going to be tracking how countries are doing in terms of progress in implementing the measures identified. Um, the resolution hasn't been without its issues. Um, to Outstanding issues at the moment are language around the human papilloma virus, so it's HPV vaccine, and the HB, H, hepatitis B, so HBV vaccines. Um, they are both cost effective and safe to use, um, and are particularly recommended amongst low and middle income countries because they help to dramatically reduce your um, cancer burden. However, um, we have seen the impact of the anti-vaccine lobby um, in a couple of member states raising questions around this. Um, and so, yes, that's, that's, we've needed to deal with that. Um, the second issue has been the perennial one around access to medicines. Um, a couple of member states have, been, have raised the importance of uh, TRIPS flexibilities. Um, but actually, the body of the discussions has been around how to delink the cost of medicines from the cost of research and development um, in order to reduce medicines prices overall. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so, in terms of what our advocacy priorities are, um, I think for us, the emphasis is on achieving consensus and actually passing the resolution. Um, for us, it's been a relatively interesting process to get us here, um, but now what we really want is the council resolution passed as a tool that we can leverage for, to advocate for further national action. Um, with this in mind, our, our focus has really been on kind of building consensus around the core elements of the resolution. Um, 
With this in mind, um, on vaccines, uh, we're supporting a general consensus text, which refers to the WHO Global Vaccine Action Plan and also Appendix 3. Both of these identify HPV and HBV as cost-effective and safe implementation. So while specific language may not be in there, which is what we were pushing for, we're happy with that. Um, on access to meds, um, the, the focus of the resolution for us is really about building stronger health systems response to cancer that includes prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and care. Um, while access to essential meds is an absolutely crucial part of this and the cost of meds central to this, um, we're actually going to be pushing for slightly broader language within the resolution that actually identifying um, more actions for the WHO Secretariat to follow up or to identify solutions around how to delink or how to explore other mechanisms for reducing the cost of meds and improving access to the cost of meds. So in terms of how you can get involved, um, so UICC is actually going to be launching a uh, cancer resolution communication campaign, um, which is focused on kind of trying to publicly drive national action following up from the resolution. Um, this package is going to include a global press release. Um, this is going to be un under embargo until the resolution is adopted, but we can happily share it with you. FAQs on the cancer resolution if you'd like to find out more. Um, a social media toolkit that my colleague Michaela, who is here with me, is actually pulling together, and that really includes key facts and messages around the resolution, um, including pieces on data and planning, prevention, and integrating cancer within the broader health community and NCDs in particular, so those might be particularly relevant for you. Um, and we're also developing a, a Twitter pocket guide with the fantastic guys from the NCD Alliance. Um, So um, all of these materials are going to be coming out on Tuesday. They're going to be available as an e-blast, and you'll be able to access them at the link on the slide included here. Um, I'm happy to stop now for any questions, or if you guys would like to carry on, then that's absolutely fine. Thank you, Rosie, and uh, thanks, Elena, as well, for uh, two fantastic presentations. A lot of information uh, contained here. We have a, a few questions coming up. I think we will take one of them uh, now, um, and that is for you, Rosie. Uh, it's a question from John Russell, which is, which member states are seeing heavy anti-vaccine lobbying? Hi, John. Um, that's a really good question. Um, in terms of states that we've been seeing a little bit of pushback from, um, we've been working with missions here. Um, it seems like India and Brazil have been the, the main two. Um, however, we've been working with, or other member states have been working to sort of bring them on side. Um, what's been really Oops, it, uh, it sounds like we may have, uh, may have lost uh, Rosie. We will make sure to, um, we will make sure to, to get the rest of her, of her answer there. I understood that she had said uh, Indian Brazil, but we will, uh, we will see if she can uh, get back onto the webinar and if we can get the rest of that answer to you in writing. Um, we will continue with the webinar now. We're moving on to agenda item 13 on health systems. Uh, back over to you, Elena. Thanks, Christina. Um, Rosie just got cut off. She will dial back in. Um, and when we pause for Q&A um, in, in a few minutes, um, she can finish her response. So I will zip through these um, last slides on the WJ fairly quickly, um, starting now with um, agenda item 13.3. The, the the report that's going to the WHA is revised to reflect the discussions that took place at the executive board, and this also explains um, a slight change in the title of the report, um, which is called Addressing the Global Shortage of, and this has been added, and Access to um, Medicines and Vaccines. So, um, at the executive board, a number of member states insisted that the report and the discussions at the WHA should provide space to discuss the 
report of the UN High-Level Panel on Access to Essential Medicines, which drew attention to the disparities in research and development and, and called for um, more policy coherence. So the current report, um, which is available online, um, highlights the need for a more comprehensive approach to address the different dimensions of access at all stages throughout the, the medicine's value change, and this includes NCDs, um, specifically on shortages, it reiterates the importance of having a, a, a clear definition of, of what, of what that, that actually means, and the secretari Secretariat will, will also conduct broader member states consultations um, this year to expand the um, involvement of all stakeholders um, on, on this issue. And I, I expect that this report will draw quite a lot of intent, attention and, 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 and longer discussions um, at, at the WHA for, for good reason. So if this is an item that you follow specifically, I recommend that you check out the report um, and stay tuned for updates from the discussions at the World Health Assembly. Next slide, please. Item 13.7, um, promoting the health of refugees and migrants. The WJ report is not online yet, so um, should be online in the coming days. The executive board in January adopted a decision which requests the director general to prepare um, both a draft framework for parties and guiding principles to promote the health of refugees and migrants, which will be considered now in May, and then also to develop in full consultation and cooperation with member states um, and the, the International Organization for Migration, the IOM, and the UNHCR and others a draft global action plan on the health of refugees and migrants, and this will be considered in two years' time at the 72nd World Health Assembly. From our perspective, it's important when developing the draft framework and the action plan to recommend um, inclusion of actions to ensure availability of NC medicines and minimize risk exposure, prioritizing in particular the implementation of WHO pen package in migrant settings and to strengthen the whole health systems to maximize the likelihood of migrants and refugees being successfully um, integrated into health systems for longer term care. Next slide, please. Moving on to promoting health throughout the life course. Next slide, please. Um, the report on health in the 2030 agenda comes in two parts. The first one focuses on global and regional progress towards achieving SDG 3 and the SDG on health. And part two describes progress made in implementing um, a resolution from last year, which was specifically on the role of the WHO and the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And here the report describes that WHO is actively supporting governments to develop comprehensive and integrated national plans for health and is also supporting member states in strengthening national statistical capacities, including um, related to the indicators for the Sustainable Development Goals. And the action for the WHA is simply to note this report. Next slide, please. There's a report on um, the role of the health sector in, in the strategic approach to international chemicals management. Um, at last year's WHA, uh, there's a request to develop a roadmap for the health sector to achieve the use um, as well as production of chemicals in ways that would minimize the significant adverse effects on human health and the environment that chemicals have by 2020. And this draft roadmap is now up for adoption at the World Health Assembly, and it covers areas um, including risk reduction, knowledge and, and evidence, institutional capacity and leadership and coordination. Um, the NCD Alliance very much supports the adoption of the draft roadmap. Um, we highlight the collaboration across member states, WHO, and other stakeholders to ensure rapid implementation of the, the roadmap, and we also very much caution against industry interference at the national level, calling on, on member states to take the appropriate steps to um, safeguard their, um, the implementation of the roadmap at the national level. Next slide. 
Um, as you know, um, women's, and cho women's Children's and Adolescents Health and the Global Strategy on Women's, Children's and Adolescents Health um, has been a priority for us um, for a while, um, looking at increased integration of, of NCD prevention and control within um, women's, children's, and adolescents' health. The report that's going to the World Health Assembly is an update um, of a, a report that went to the executive board in, in January, and um, it has a specific spotlight on adolescents. Um, highlighting both the investments that member states and WHO um, are doing to improve adolescents' health and emphasizes um, in this context as well health-related behaviors that begin or are consolidated during adolescence, including tobacco use, including alcohol and drug use, and including physical inactivity and poor diets. Future sessions of the WHO um, will focus on early childhood development in the context of the strategy, which is obviously um, quite important from an NCD perspective. Um, the report also mentions that WHO is finalizing, uh, together with um, the H6 partnership and UNESCO, a country-level guidance on implementing global accelerated action on adolescent, adolescent health, um, and the WHA is invited to note the report. Next slide, please. So coming to the final um, of the agenda items that I will be covering, WHO reform. Next slide. Um, focusing here on the framework for engagement with non-state actors. Um, report A70-52 provides an overview of the implementation of the framework for engagement with non-state actors to date. Um, as a reminder, FENSA, um, which is the short, the, the acronym for the framework for engagement with non-state actors, was uh, agreed and adopted last year. And um, WHO has two years to operationalize this framework. Mm -hmm. And according to the report, WHO is on track to, um, to meet the, this timeline of, of two years for full operationalization. Um, the WHO Register of Non-State Actors, which is um, an overview of all of the non-state actors that WHO engages with, with is currently pilot, piloted, and there's a link to the pilot included on this slide. WHO is also finalizing a guide for its staff on how to implement FENSA and has been consulting with non-state actors on a handbook specifically intended for the use of non-state actors. There was a consultation here in Geneva on the um, NSA handbook on FENSA last Friday. Um, and if anybody is interested in, in, in this consultation, we're happy to share um, notes that we took during this consultation. Dojo was um, previously, um, or Dojo previously intended to share this handbook by the time of the WJ, but we understand that this timeline is no longer feasible and that it will be slightly delayed. With regards to principles for secondments from NGOs, which is something that was requested by the WHA last year, the, the document for the World Health Assembly is not online yet. However, the set of criteria and principles was already shared at the executive board. Um, and just to note here that um, with regards to secondments, private sector is excluded from the secondments. Um, and um, we'll wait for, for the actual final uh, document for, for details. Moving on, next slide. So I'll just be recapping our advocacy priorities for the World Health Assembly. Next slide. Our advocacy priorities, in a nutshell, are um, calling to, on member states to show that they're serious about addressing their country's NCD burden, um, focusing on building momentum for a successful 2018 UN high-level meeting on NCDs um, with, with a specific focus currently on the preparatory process to ensure that um, the high-level meeting um, in, in 2018 is successful call on member states to invest in cost-effective NCD interventions to accelerate progress at the national level, um, in particular um, calling on member states to support 
the adoption of the WJ resolution on NCDs with full endorsement of the updated NCD, um, sorry, for updated Appendix 3. Um, call on member states to protect future generations um, committing to address childhood obesity, supporting the adoption of the implementation plan to end childhood obesity, um, including um, a specific focus to address commercial determinants of, of this epidemic, and um, calling on member states to mandate the Secretariat to develop a robust monitoring and accountability framework to, to track progress against um, the, the global response to address childhood obesity. Next slide. Financing, um, moving really from rhetoric to, to action here to mobilize adequate and sustained financial resources for NCDs, and this includes um, also the um, work of the WHO on NCDs supporting an increase in assessed contributions to um, help close the funding gap in WHO's work for NCDs. We're supporting the adoption of the Global Action Plan in Dementia and the 2017 Cancer Resolution. Um, we encourage you all to continue to, to raise the awareness of the linkages between NCDs and other priorities such as maternal, um, uh, such as women's, adolescents and child health, migrants' health, and the expo exposure to chemicals, um, uh, et cetera and um, calling on the next WHO Director General to show visionary leadership to strengthen WHO's role as the leading UN agency on NCDs. Next slide. So wrapping up my presentation, um, please let us know if you're attending the World Health Assembly. If you haven't um, done so yet, please join us for our uh, civil society advocacy briefing on Sunday, the 21st of May. Um, we'll be talking about that in a second in more detail. Um, update us on, on relevant intelligence and um, share your advocacy priorities with us and um, plan statements, any of your messaging that we can promote through our own communications channels. Um, please share our advocacy messages with your government contacts and member state delegations on the ground. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to reach out to me um, personally. And um, for all those that are unable to attend the World Health Assembly in person, all the sessions will be webcast, and we'll also be sharing live updates via our e alerts and our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, now we have a chance for a little bit of a of a Q and A. A few questions have been have been coming in. We had a question from Tamara Baresh um, asking if um, NCDs in emergency contexts and in conflict settings is prioritized at the WHA agenda this year, and does the NCD Alliance advocate around NCDs in uh, emergency? context. Uh, this, I believe, was covered in Elena's presentation where she highlighted that there will be an agenda item 13.7 uh, precisely on promoting the health of refugees and migrants. And in that uh, presentation of Elena, she was able to, to share some of the actions that uh, the NCD Alliance recommends for the inclusion in the WHO draft framework and action plan uh, to promote the health of refugees and migrants. We also had a few uh, questions, reactions coming in when Elena was presenting on Appendix 3. We had a comment um, encouraged at the support for palliative care that we're seeing in Appendix 3. We also have a comment here from Sonia Kalmeyer saying that um, 
the, the best buys are still not fully integrating the evidence on physical activity, and there's a backlog of evidence on physical activity that needs to be urgently addressed. In response to this comment, Sonia, uh, the NCD Alliance is advocating around the forthcoming physical activity action plan, and we're looking at integrating uh, current concerns around resources and evidence. So please stay engaged in the consultation process that we will be conducting for the, that will be conducted for the, the action plan. We have as well a couple of questions um, that I would like to ask from um, our staff uh, person based in New York, um, and those are two closely related ones. One is, um, so what would be the process to convene the proposed UN Civil Society Task Force as we're looking towards the 2018 UN high-level meeting? And what would be the process to participate or to be a part of the task force and also the interactive civil society hearing? Priya? Thanks very much, Christina. Um, so the answers to both of those questions are, are very much related um, in that this civil society task force is something that would be called for and organized by the Office of the President of the General Assembly, um, who is based here in New York, um, and that would be the PGA, President of the General Assembly, who, who will be uh, taking office in September. Um, and so based off of that, uh, they will call for this hearing, and if member states agree that it should indeed take place, then the motions will be set to put this into place, and the, um, the modalities for participation of civil society will also then be agreed by um, member states uh, together with the Office of the PGA. So um, we will be following this process and, of course, be liaising with the PGA once he's appointed in the fall to make sure that we can, in fact, get the civil society task force in place and make sure that there's broad representation and participation from civil society um, advocates around the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Priya. Um, and now one uh, quick question for uh, Elena that has just uh, come in before we move on to the next item of the agenda. But the quick question uh, for you, Elena, is uh, regarding uh, diabetes and particularly type 1 diabetes. Um, where does it stand in the current uh, WHA agenda? Thank you, Christina, and thank you for the question. Um, there is no specific focus this year on diabetes or, or type 1 diabetes specifically within the WHA agenda. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, right, with uh, we, I'm being mindful of, of time. Uh, we still have quite quite a lot to cover. So, um, if I could Rosie ask is back online, if that's helpful. Oh, thank you, thank you. Rosie, you were cut halfway through your uh, answer to the question regarding um, the, the anti-vaccine lobby. Could you could you just finish that off for us, please? Yes, of course. And uh, sorry to everyone about that. Everything my phone likes a much more brief answer than I was going to give. Um, just in case I go again, um, if anyone does have questions about the cancer resolution more specifically or about social media, um, you can always reach us at advocacy at uicc.org. With that caveat. Um, Go back to the question, the greatest pushback we saw was predominantly from um, India and Brazil. There were one or two um, African states who had questions about the evidence base. Um, what was really heartening though was though that actually in terms of responses to that, we've seen a really strong response again from a lot of African states are pushing, actively pushing for specific language around HPV and HBV. Um, because they see it as a really cost-effective and safe intervention that they can implement um, nationally. Um, there's also some support across Europe and Latin America as well in particular. Um, so we're, we're fairly hopeful for a, for a positive, positive outcome. I hope that helps answer the question. That's a fantastic and very comprehensive uh, answer, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
and, and now just being mindful of the time uh, that we have remaining for this webinar, we are going to move on to the next agenda item. We are going to move on to uh, WHA side events. And to talk us through uh, this agenda item, we have Jessica Beagley, NCD Alliance's Policy and Research Officer. Hello there. Sorry, I just made the mistake of changing my own slide. Thanks ever so much, Bruce. Um, so for the um, for the WHA technical briefings, um, as it says here clearly, these will take place from 12:30 to 14:15 uh, to 2:15 in the afternoon, and they will be on the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of the World Health Assembly. Um, the first one on Wednesday, um, vaccines often associated with being um, linked most strongly to communicable diseases, but as we've heard from Rosie, um, obviously the very important factor in um, the response to cervical cancer. Um, on the Thursday, we've got universal health coverage, um, which will um, go into um, the, the latest progress on, on addressing universal health coverage. Um, and that we do have a little bit more information on the health and the environment technical briefing, um, and we understand that it will showcase success stories and solutions from countries and different municipalities that have successfully addressed environmental health risks, um, whether that's polluted air or water or sanitation and chemical hazards to illustrate how action across sectors can is really crucial in increasing resilience um, and mitigating climate change. Um, we understand that the briefing will also feature WHO initiatives such as the joint one with WHO, UNEP and the World Meteorological Organization on Climate Change, Health and Environment, and also the WHO Urban Health Initiative that's being implemented with the Climate and Clean Air Coalition um, to address air pollution in particular. Next slide, please. Um, and so for the NCD Alliance um, side events, we've got our usual civil society advocacy briefing on Sunday afternoon at the new UICC offices, and this will be a chance for different NCD civil society representatives to come together and strategize in um, more detail than we ever could do online about how to address the, the many different items that are coming up at WHA. And then we've got a round table um, um, that's hosted by PATH, in which NCDA is supporting on the need for multi-sectoral action when it comes to addressing um, access to, to medicines. Um, another roundtable on Wednesday morning on sustainable financing for, for NCDs, and this is particularly important in the, in the lead up to the, uh, the UN high level meeting 2018. Um, and we're hoping that we'll see yeah, really diverse participation across sectors for, for this roundtable and in the wider NCD response um, financing. On Thursday, there's um, a side event which will um, launch a call for a, a World Lung Day. Um, there are already World Days for diabetes, for cancer, for cardiovascular disease, and for many other diseases, but we haven't yet seen one um, dedicated to um, respiratory health and all the different elements that that involves. Um, so very much welcome your participation there. There'll be a report launched um, at the meeting as well as a, a charter um, for World Lung Health. Next slide, please. The NCD Alliance's main event will be on Monday evening looking at success factors in the NCD response and different pathways that we have to, to accelerate progress. Um, well, we fully recognize that there is no standard formula or blueprint um, for the NCD response in the many different contexts across the world. There are common success factors and catalytic strategies that can be applicable to many different economic set settings. And we'll hear about different examples of good practice from experts across different sectors of society. Um, and this also is obviously very timely given the, the lead up to the 2018 meeting. Um, we're delighted that we have one Minister of Health confirmed, Dr. Rajiv Sanarathne from Sri Lanka. Um, we're still waiting to hear back on the Ministers of Health of Canada and Lithuania. Jeff, um, as we are speaking, we have the confirmation that we'll be joined by the Deputy Minister of Health from Canada. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> That's very good news. Um, we also have James Hospitalis from CAFA, Paula Johns from ACT Plus, which is the Brazilian NCD Alliance, and Evan Lee from Eli Lilly. Um, and yeah, the capacity for that is very, very large um, for that particular event, so please do come along and join us. There is space for all of us. Next slide, please. 
Um, and then we enter um, what, believe it or not, is a select subsection of the NCD events calendar for the World Health Assembly. Um, sadly, I don't have time to go through even all the events on this, on this shorter list, but to name um, just a few. On Sunday afternoon, there is um, a reception um, by WHO and Bloomberg Philanthropies on Partnerships for Healthy Cities. Um, Monday morning, important, um, probably the event of the week for the dementia community hosted by Alzheimer's Disease International. Um, IDF's event on Tuesday morning on access to medicines specifically for diabetes. NCD Child's event on better medicines for children. Sanofi's event on Tuesday evening. Um, again on access to health. Access is a <laughs> strong theme at the World Health Assembly side events this year. Um, on Wednesday, the first event of the day that is probably relevant to people on this call is um, looking at displaced people with chronic conditions and how to address pandemics on the move, so very much linked to the migrant health agenda. Um, Wednesday lunchtime, um, there's an event by the International Federation of Psoriasis Associations um, looking at how psoriasis is going to feature in the NCD response in the lead up to 2018. Um, two interesting events on um, Wednesday evening, one on driving um, progress on the health SDG, um, important topic, and then um, uh, another roundtable on the future of NCDs in, in a shifting global health landscape. Um, Thursday morning is um, the event by the WHO GCM um, NCD, where I understand they're very keen to um, get together in person with the different members of the, the GCM. Um, on Thursday lunchtime, um, an event on partnerships by Access Accelerated. Um, also Thursday lunchtime, uh, the call to action for lung health um, that I've already mentioned. On Thursday evening, um, uh, an event that NCDA is also involved in, though it doesn't reflect it in this calendar just yet, um, which will look at youth participation in the NCD response. Um, and another one that NCD Alliance is also involved in on the same evening on um, addressing the commercial determinants of health. Um, so that's yeah, looking at sugar and fat and alcohol and tobacco, but very much as commercial determinants um, within the, the NCD respect. On Friday, um, there's um, sorry. On, on Tuesday is an event that I really wanted to flag that's unfortunately fallen off the bottom of this page. It's World No Tobacco Day on the 31st of May, and there is um, an official side event on the 30th of May, um, which you can see more details about in the WHO journal. Um, I think that's it for side events. But if anyone has got any questions. I don't think we've had any. Thank you, Jess, for that uh, comprehensive overview. I think it's a testament to the growth and momentum of the NCD movement to see the amount of NCD-related side events at the WHA. I would just like to remind everybody that the NCD Alliance has a WHA resource page. That link will be live in these slides that, we, that will be shared after the webinar, and I encourage you to, to, to visit that resource page as we do keep a, a, a calendar that is constantly being updated on side events. So we would call out on our um, uh, partner organizations and, uh, and organizations in our network to please flag with us any side event uh, that is uh, related to, to NCDs if you don't see it currently listed in our, um, in our calendar. Moving, moving on, uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to move on as quickly as we can. I'm going to uh, pass over to Jimena Marquez, our communications manager, um, as well as Lucy Westerman, our communications and policy officer, who are going to tell us more about uh, communications efforts surrounding the upcoming WHA. Over to you, Jimena. Thank you, Christina. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So very, very quickly, what do we want to achieve from our comms efforts during World Health Assembly? We want to increase government's action on NCDs, to promote NCDs as a priority throughout the, the Assembly, to support and amplify NCD community messaging, and to celebrate the evolution of NCDA from an informal alliance to, to an NGO. Our mantra this, for this World Health Assembly will be uh, no progress without uh, action. Um, 
So here in this slide, you can see a, a recap of what Alena has covered. Um, this is the set of our um, messages for World Health Assembly. So we are asking member states to show that they are serious about addressing uh, the uh, NCD burden at country level, to invest in cost-effective NCD interventions and to accelerate progress, to protect future generations, and, and to, to particularly commit to address childhood obesity, um, moving from rhetoric to action, mobilizing adequate, adequate and sustained financial resources, and a call uh, for action to the next WHO Director General to, to lead on an integrated vision for NCD prevention and control. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, here we have um, the, the tools and resources for, for, for the World Health Assembly. Um, this year include um, the NCD Alliance process priorities, the road to the UN 2018 high-level meeting on NCDs. This document will be available in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. We will also have uh, an infographic called No Progress Without Action in three languages, um, and another infographic called NCDs across SDGs, um, which may focuses on the interlinkages between non-communicable diseases and the sustainable development goals. Um, the, we will also um, provide um, template messages for social networks in three languages. And we are really excited about the launch of our uh, two-minute audiovisual about NCDs during World Health Assembly. It will um, mainly focus on a, a, a very uh, brief um, definition of what NCDs are, the link to modifiable risk factors, uh, introducing uh, the NCD Alliance network and a clearly call to action at, at the end. And this year we have, as, as usual, our set of policy briefs, in, including uh, our updated ambitious smart commitments to address NCDs, overweight, and obesity. And, and we will be launching, as usual, our annual report. Next slide, please. Okay, so we will be updating uh, our website with fresh content almost da daily as from next week. So please uh, visit our homepage, news and event pages. Um, our newsletter will cover uh, World Health Assembly uh, specifically. Um, so we look forward to um, connecting with you, and we will be making available all, all these tools and resources in the, following, in the following days. So let me pass over to my colleague, Lucy Westerman, who will provide you with some highlights of our social media efforts during World Health Assembly. Thank you. Over to you, Hello, Lucy. everyone. Thank you, Jimena. Um, thanks very much, Jimena, and hello to everybody. Just very quickly, because I know we're fairly tight on time, um, and you'll be able to catch up on this online after the webinar. Um, the main form of social media we'll be using is going to be on Twitter, where we have quite a, an active pre presence already. Last year we found that during WHA69, we were one of the, the main influences on the, um, on the social media space for Twitter, and so we're hoping to build on that. Uh, it is going to be challenging with a lot of conversations around the DG election, so we'd like to try and make sure we get NCDs up there in, um, in social conversations to make sure that we lead into 2018 with, with quite a bit of extra momentum. So um, there's going to be a lot of things we share online, as Jimena said. We're preparing a lot of content and resources. Uh, we'll also be developing the, the social media messaging based on those key advocacy messages, and we'll be sharing event details, handles for um, speakers at events, uh, official statements, news such as when the DG is elected, um, and also amplifying messages from within our network. Next slide please. 
Um, we'll also be using Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Um, YouTube will obviously be the home to our and soon to be launched video on MCDs, uh, but we'll also use those other channels if you are on there. Next slide, please. And so just as a final sheet, which again you can read through in your own time, um, around social media tips. So in terms of um, in terms of WHA, we really encourage you to use the WHA70 hashtag as a sort of key one, um, in addition to the NCDs hashtag um, alongside it. But try and get NCDs up there as part of the big um, WHA conversation. Try and piggyback on anything that's relevant and trending in terms of hashtags. So sometimes global health gets pushed up there, so that's uh, another good one to piggyback NCDs onto. Make sure you check your spelling um, and make your tweets quality tweets so they're really worth um, retweeting, sharing, amplifying. Um, use other platforms if you're on them. So we can't be everywhere, but if you are on Weibo or Snapchat or Google+, get the conversation happening out there. Um, engage with your influencers um, and, and reply to them um, and also with your followers. Use the visuals as much as you can. Good quality visuals get a lot more um, engagement on social media and we'll be providing and sharing quite a lot of those for you to use. Um, if you have um, another language that you're skilled at, so if you, if you could translate messages, that would be ex excellent as well. Report live, um, meet with other tweeters, get offline and have conversations with people in real life. Um, be active as yourself and as your organisation, which helps to obviously get the conversation um, amplified as well. And keep an eye out for the UICC NCDA Twitter pocket guide that Rosie spoke earlier. Um, but most of all, we look forward to seeing you online and um, seeing lots of NCDs related activity. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy and Jimena. A huge amount of information there on how uh, people and organizations can get involved with this uh, WHA and help build uh, momentum around NCDs and to uh, support NCD advocacy. Um, Oof, I've got a, a question came in just now from uh, Jim Cleary. Um, I wonder if this was in the, the slides, but I wonder, uh, Lucy or Jimena, could you answer? Is there a common NCD hashtag? Um, yes, yeah, so I will be using the NCDs, literally NCDS hashtag as, as the main one. Um, occasionally you'll find that other hashtags come up such as cancer or um, NCD, but if we can try and be consistent across the community with NCDs, it'll get it um, up there and trending. Thank you, uh, Lucy and uh, Jimena. I realize we are over time, so we are moving quickly now. We appreciate those of you that are able to stay with us beyond the, the 90 minutes. We will be as fast as we can. Next slide, please. We now would like to uh, update you on the WHO Global Conference on NCDs that is scheduled for this year. I'm going to pass over to Priya Kanayasan, uh, who is based in New York with the, and is Advocacy Officer for the NCD Alliance. Over to you, Priya. Thanks very much, Christina, and thanks to those of you who have stuck with us uh, through this very informative presentation. So I will be very brief um, and go over uh, the WHO Global Conference on Non-Communicable Diseases, which will be held in Montevideo, Uruguay from the 18th to 20th of October this year, uh, and will focus on enhancing policy coherence between different sectors of policy making that have a bearing on reaching the Sustainable Development Goal targets 3.4 on NCDs by 2030. As a reminder, target 3.4 is to reduce by one-third premature mortality from NCDs through prevention and treatment and to promote mental health and well-being. So the conference is being held in Uruguay as President Tabare Vasquez has been a vocal supporter of addressing NCDs and has implemented policies in the country to advance prevention and control of NCDs. So he's been a staunch vocal supporter um, calling for global leadership on NCDs um, at the highest level and at the UN General Assembly. Uh, so as you can see, the goal of the conference of this three-day meeting is to highlight the critical links between reducing premature deaths from NCDs uh, and enhancing policy coherence across the areas that impact governance, prevention, management, and surveillance of NCDs. And the, there are four objectives for the conference. 
uh, as you can see there, um, again, to provide guidance to member states on how to reach target 3.4 by 2030 by influencing the various public policies and sectors that go beyond health, launching a new set of global initiatives to help countries accelerate progress, um, exchanging national experiences, best practices, challenges, etc., um, and highlighting the health sector as the key advocate for enhancing poli policy coherence and really bringing everyone together. Um, and this, of course, is because while we know that target 3.4 is the main NCD target, we know in order to actually achieve it, action on goals and targets other than 3.4 um, is required and as the risk factors for NCDs lie in goals such as two on nutrition, uh, four on education, and goal 13 on climate change. So this conference will bring together a broad range of participants. As you can see here, um, it's meant to be truly multi-stakeholder and go beyond the usual suspects. Uh, this will include bringing together ministers of agriculture, finance, planning, uh, and many others, as you can see, as well as public policy decision makers, various UN agencies and organizations, uh, global experts, and non-state actors, of course, in addition to ministers of health, heads of state, and heads of government. So the um, components of this conference, there are three. Uh, the first will be a multi-stakeholder dialogue, which will be between member states, UN agencies, and non-state actors. The second, a ministerial segment for member states, UN organizations uh, at the level of ministers and national NCD directors. And a third segment um, that will be high level, and this will be for member states and UN agencies at the level of heads of state and heads of government, um, as well as heads of UN organizations. So over these three days, these three different components will meet and discuss to agree an outcome document. Um, more information on participation will become available in the coming months. Um, so we will, of course, share updates with you as it is available. Um, a little bit more on the outcome document. So this will be a negotiated document. Um, that uh, will, is expected to be endorsed by participants of the conference. Um, and the timing of this is rather good as it comes before the third high-level meeting on NCDs, which, as Elena mentioned, will take place in 2018. Um, so the conference provides an opportunity to discuss the priorities and action needed to advance the NCD agenda. And we expect that the outcome document may serve as input both into discussion at uh, next year's WHA on preparations for the high-level meeting and into the intergovernmental process on the outcome document for the HLM itself. Um, again, Elena went over our process priorities for the 2018 high-level meeting earlier, um, and we will be sharing more information about a consultation with all relevant stakeholders to develop our, um, our meaning the NCD civil society community's priorities for the outcome of the HLM. So sh more information will be available, and we will continue to update you uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Priya, um, I think it's important to, to underline just the, the, the significance of this global conference on NCDs and how really it will help uh, build momentum towards the 2018 uh, UN high-level meeting. Uh, we have a, a, a comment, uh, not so much a, a question, but basically a comment uh, regarding uh, involvement of uh, an inclusion of people with uh, disabilities at increased risk of of NCDs, and I just wanted to share here that uh, that the NCD Alliance is uh, is is working on uh, on an initiative that really seeks to increase the meaningful involvement of of people living with uh, NCDs. We really do believe that uh, with regards to the 2018 UN High Level Meeting, this is something that we would really like to to see happen. That uh, direct involvement of, of of people affected by NCDs. Uh, being mindful of our limited time, I would like to move on to the next and final agenda item. Next slide, please. Um, back over to uh, Jessica Beagley, our Policy Research Officer, who's going to tell us about the NCD Alliance Accountability Toolkit. Over to you, Jess. Hi again, everyone. I can promise that there are three slides left, and they have less than five bullet points on each, so it really will be fast now. <laughs> so um, accountability is 
um, something that um, the NCD Alliance hasn't focused specifically on until now, but it's what we recognise as one of the four pillars of um, the role, yeah, one of the four roles of civil society. Um, so much of the NCD response and indeed the NCD Alliance's response to date has focused on advocacy to ensure that commitments are made in the very first instance. Um, but as we all sadly know, advocacy commitments are completely meaningless unless they are met in the time frame specified or soon after it. Um, and civil society is especially well placed to be able to facilitate independent accountability um, to complement government reporting um, to um, the international level. Next slide, please. So back in 2013, the NCD Alliance produced an online advocacy toolkit called Non-Communicable Diseases Join the Fight. Um, and this included a benchmarking tool, which you can see on this page here, um, as a means to facilitate national and regional civil society organizations to track progress um, in their geographical area of focus. And civil society status reports were produced um, for, by the organizations working in Brazil, the Caribbean, East Africa, India, and South Africa, and you can find those at the link below. Um, the updated 2017 toolkit focuses exclusively on accountability. Um, it introduces the, the concept of accountability for those who aren't already familiar um, with the intricacies of it. It outlines the role for civil society, and it provides an updated, ben um, an updated version of the 2013 benchmarking tool, as well as providing case studies and tips throughout. And the benchmarking tool covers um, four key areas that you might recognize from places like the WHO, EMRO, and CD Action Plan. Um, namely governance, risk factor reduction, monitoring, surveillance and evaluation, and health systems. Um, um, what's really important here is that um, although we, you know, the indicators themselves, although they're very extensive, the ones that we've listed in the benchmarking tool, just replying to the indicators really won't um, show off what civil society is able to offer um, in that what we're really hoping is that civil society as experts and advocates on, on the ground will be able to identify not only what the national context is for any given indicator, um, but to be able to expand in their civil society status report on the reasons um, that progress has been hindered, whether that's funding or industry interference, and to explore whether much progress has been made in recent years or whether things are um, relatively static. And then to um, that, yeah, the, the benchmarking tool also provides um, recommended advocacy actions um, to try and follow up um, where progress hasn't been sufficient. Uh, next slide, please. So the advocacy, uh, the accountability toolkit <laughs> is due to be launched in June, in the the week of the 19th of June, um, and it will be available first in English and then translated into French and Spanish. That will follow in July. Um, we'll hold a webinar for civil society to support people who are using the benchmarking tool in August. Um, and if you would like to join that webinar, please um, send me an email and we'll share an invitation with you. would be more than happy to. Um, yeah, we, we heard back as, as some feedback from the last benchmarking tool that data collection can be um, quite slow and that support is useful. Um, so we, we really do want to engage with people as they're going through filling out um, this, this benchmarking tool. Um, it's our intention that the findings, um, as I mentioned, will be um, placed into civil society status reports, um, and it would be particularly valuable if these can be used to, <coughs> to inform civil society priorities and inputs into the regional preparatory meetings um, in, in preparation for the 2018 high-level meeting. Um, you can see a, a link, um, which is actually for the NCD Alliance um, priorities in the lead-up to this meeting, but which also gives a bit more detail on the regional preparatory meetings and the hope that they will take place. Um, and the, the ultimate aim of the, um, of the accountability toolkit is to accelerate progress in advance of the 2018 high-level meeting, but we really hope that the shelf life will um, extend for a long time after that um, and that it will cement recognition by governments and for the need for strong, meaningful commitments at the HLM and beyond. Um, that is now it from me, and it's 4.43 in the UK. Thank you, Jess, uh, and thank you to, to all participants for having uh, accompanied us till the, the very end of this uh, extended webinar. I hope that what we have been able, able to convey is that there is a flurry of activity happening at the upcoming WHA and many um, advocacy um, opportunities.
opportunities available to uh, for us to to take advantage of. I will remind everybody that uh, the PowerPoints of this webinar will be shared uh, with live links and also the video recording of this webinar will be uh, made available shortly. So thank you everybody and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation and you may now disconnect.